welcome everybody. This is the um, my name is or my name is Thijs Martens and, uh, and I'm here actually together with my colleague um, Francesco uh, De Fazio. Uh, and I will be helping to facilitate uh, this uh, this webinar. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. Um, in the attendee list, I've seen a lot of familiar names, but also some new people. We have a lot of registrants. I think people are still coming in. Um, thanks a lot also for um, for your questions thus far. Uh, we've seen a lot of questions um, and we will likely not be able to answer them all with the content of this webinar or in, within the Q&A sec sec section, but uh, we will try to uh, answer all of your questions afterwards. Uh, before we start, there's some uh, practical information. Um, all of you are muted. Um, uh, in, if you have any questions, then please ask them through the question button on the top right of your screen. And uh, that's the question marks. Uh, we will see your questions coming in and we will start handling your questions at the end of the webinar. Or if not possible, we will certainly take a look at your questions and afterwards, after the webinar, we'll, uh, we'll start answering them. Uh, also important to mention is that uh, this webinar will be recorded. So in case you need to drop out at some point, don't be scared. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we will send the, uh, the recording to you. Um, if we then start to look at the agenda for today. Now, of course, we want to tell you a little bit about uh, who we are. Uh, but what's really particular about this agenda is, um, yeah, I feel it's somewhat of an important milestone is the fact that we're not really talking about and not extensively talking about um, the, the vision of the circular economy. Um, yeah, so we're not talking about why a circular economy, but really about how to implement circular economy principles. And um, yeah, this webinar is really about making the circular um, innovation work. So um, when you look at the rest of the agenda, our circular revenues and requirements framework, how we look at circular revenues and requirements designed for this assembly, and it's important, obviously, uh, the main challenges we see eh, and, and our strategies to overcome these challenges, our assessment methodology, maybe the heart of this presentation, and then of course also a, a, a case study to make things more practical. Afterwards, we will quickly address that this is part of a bigger platform that we're trying to create. Uh, and we will also move into the questions and answers section, but uh, we hope to have a, a lot of those. Um, when we move then into who we are today. So um, who we are, um, we are part of uh, Philips Engineering Solutions, and we are an integral part of Philips, and, and we sit within the uh, Innovation and Strategy Department. Um, what we do is we help accelerate innovation by providing flexible competences in Philips's businesses, markets and functions. And for sustainability, that means that we help our businesses realize our sustainability targets. Um, and of course, also our circular economy targets. Um, we work for Philips. Uh, but we also work for external companies. So in the case that you are interested in what we do, please reach out because we have a mandate to export all the knowledge that we are building up uh, within our um, um, entity. Now, when we then look at uh, this webinar, uh, of course, we have a, a, a pretty well known uh, sustainability program. Our targets in the circular economy, as you can see in the middle section, they are quite bold, which means that a lot of activities pro and programs are running across our organization to help make things happen. Um, and because we believe in the importance of, uh, of, of yeah, shared responsibility, uh, we have created this platform and this webinar to leverage the investments and, and, and the knowledge that we have built up um, over the past years to, um, to help accelerate achievements in the circular economy with other organizations. This is the first uh, webinar uh, of a series. Uh, that is intended to plant um, yeah, seeds for deeper collaboration uh, for companies with an impact oriented mindset. Um, personally, um, and I mean this, uh, I am extremely proud uh, to be working in a company where, um, where we have the opportunity to share knowledge beyond the four walls of Philips. I believe it's an important part of uh, the sustainability mindset to do that. And um, yeah, I could not at this moment wishing to be in a better place or another place. Um, now, all of this, of course, eh, sharing all of that important knowledge would not be possible 
with the help of the real smart people in the room. And that's where Francesco <laughs> comes in. He's already smiling. Um, but Francesco is one of our colleagues who specialized in, in circular design. And um, yeah, I think uh, not just for Francesco, but for the entire team, uh, I'm always amazed by the uh, amazing drive uh, that we see internally to make better products, more circular products. And um, yeah, I think that Francesco is one of the people within Philips that really and truly uh, helps to redefine the quality of our products. And, uh, and Francesco, before I make you feel even more uncomfortable, I, I want to hand it over to you so that you can take us into that uh, deep content and I'll stay here to uh, to moderate the questions and then pick it up from you afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Francesco, to you. Thank you, Thais. Um, yeah, so I would like to start from the meaning of circular design. Um, circular design for us is really about creating value for customers and businesses in a resource constrained world. Um, we always say that that uh, designing for circular requires a sort of mind shift from the traditional way of designing products from for a linear economy. When we design for circularity, we must take into account uh, the end of life scenarios of the product that we are focusing on. Uh, we must identify those most suitable scenario to the specific product and context, and we must uh, plan for them. Uh, we have really to make sure that the design of the product that we are working on is sufficiently optimized to enable uh, these end of life strategies. So to, to guide our overall strategy and uh, processes, uh, we often refer to this uh, uh, high level circular economy framework. Uh, this is a framework that was developed internally in Philips uh, and uh, it, it's a very nice framework because it clearly and easily uh, explain how two of the main ingredients of, of circular economy are connected to each other. One ingredient is uh, business models uh, and the other ingredient is uh, the design of the product. On the top part, you can see those uh, uh, eight main categories uh, of what we call circular revenue models. Those are those business models that can be profitable in a circular economy. On the left, instead, you see the vertical list of the main, we call them circular ready requirements. These are design features that are necessary to embe be embedded in a design to to enable those uh, revenue models. And from this uh, uh, metric, you can actually see also, for instance, how um, the requirements that in this framework is called easy to disassemble, repair and reassemble, that in more technical terms is, is what we call design for disassembly, is actually very relevant for multiple circular revenue models. Uh, for instance, refurbishment, but also part harvesting and different services. So I would like to spend a moment on uh, the, the meaning, the terminology of design for disassembly, because we know that sometimes different institutions and companies uh, uh, can use the same terminology to actually mean very different things. Uh, what we mean with design for disassembly is designing the product in such a way that the product or its parts can be disassembled and reassembled in a non-destructive way. And this again to enable those different uh, possible circular strategies like uh, repair, refurbishment, parts recovery. This is a definition that, that we define it also based on a recent European standard, the N4554, uh, for the assessment of repair, reuse and upgrade of energy related products. What we do not consider uh, as a strategy directly linked to disassembly is recycling. The reason is that recycling is a very different process compared to the one that I previously mentioned. Uh, there are very different type of stakeholders involved, uh, different type of processes. Uh, uh, for instance, it's a destructive process. It's mostly automated, at least in Europe and in Western countries, and is really focused on material liberation and sorting. For that reason, we use different Different, very different type of guidelines, approach, methods, and tools to release uh, designing for, for recycling. So, 
Design for this assembly is fundamental for four main reasons. These are the key value drivers that we always use to push this topic forward in different businesses. Uh, the first reason is about making new design future proof by anticipating possible future regulations. Uh, many of you in this call may have heard about new repair labeling system coming up in different countries in Europe, new uh, uh, repair and disassembly requirements embedded in new eco design directives uh, uh, for certain product category. For us, it's very clear that if we are designing today a design, uh, a specific product or or even a platform that must be used, that we are going to reuse for many years ahead, we must take into account this topic now. Uh, the second reason is about improving efficiency and quality of existing operations. Uh, many times uh, when we work with different businesses, we actually find out that they already have repair and even refurbishment operations sometimes in place. Uh, but even if these operations are, are there, the design of the product is often not yet fully optimized for them, determining a lot of inefficiencies in the process. The third reason is about enabling new circular business model uh, by making them economically feasible. The topic of circular economy and sustainability has become a super hot topic in the past year or two, and we really see more and more businesses that simply try to apply a circular business model to a product that was never meant for it. And again, we see a lot of these pilots and tests failing because of that reason, because many times the product simply does not allow to make a profit out of it. And the fourth and final reason and uh, value driver that we often try to push on is answering the growing consumer interest for more sustainable and long lasting products. Uh, consumer is really not a surprise, are really becoming more and more sensitive to the overall topic of sustainability. But what we have been seeing in the uh, recent years uh, is that they are really starting to uh, connect the topic of being able, to, for instance, to repair and to have durable products uh, to a sort of personal action that they can take to have a more sustainable lifestyle. And they are really asking, uh, expecting from manufacturer to really take responsibility uh, on, on these topics. So in most of the projects that we work on, we always find a key, a key challenge that is about how to make a circular design economically and strategically interesting for a business. We often uh, have to face this challenging, but also really necessary balance between sustainability investments, so possible uh, cost uplift uh, determined by the improved design of the product and boundaries conditions uh, determined, for instance, by quality, regulatory and safety. Our approach to solve this challenge, to address this challenge, is by using a very comprehensive process that look at the big picture by selecting the correct, the most suitable, sustainable and design strategy for the product and the context that we are looking at, by identifying cost effective uh, redesign solutions that really try to minimize that possible cost uplift in the product, and by considering the total cost of ownership, so really trying to move the business from just being focused on the specific cost of producing the product to considering the overall uh, ownership cost. And, and then finally, by intervening from the earlier stages of the design process and of course by prioritizing our battles. So here you can see the overall process that we uh, usually follow when we design for circularity and specifically for this assembly. In the first step, we try to combine and put all those activities that we always try to carry out independently by uh, the design strategy that we are going to focus on. So whether we are going to focus on this assembly or another type of design aspect. The other five steps instead are really those that are really specific for this assembly um, and that we are going to carry out only if this assembly is uh, eventually selected as uh, one of the most sustainable design strategies. So uh, we are now going to go step by step in this process so we can also show you a bit more in detail what we actually try to do in, in each step. What we always start from is by really 
defining uh, um, the, the most sustainable, again, sustainable and design strategy. We use this uh, three layer approach uh, where we start from the bigger picture. So identifying the sustainable strategy, uh, more, more suitable for the specific product and context that we're working at on. Uh, example could be more eco efficiency related strategies like energy efficiency, improving durability or more really core circular economy related strategy like reuse, repair, refurbishment or recycling. Uh, after we define the most suitable sustainable strategies that by the way, they could be multiple ones connected to each other. Uh, we then go a layer deeper. We define, we identify those design strategies that are necessary to enable that overarching sustainable strategy. Again, example of design strategies are designed for disassembly, but also much beyond that. So for instance, diagnostics, design for dismantling, uh, design for cleanability or standardization. And finally, after doing that, uh, we try to go to the deeper level that is uh, identifying what we call design focus areas. These are specific design features that we want to prioritize and, and focus on and optimize our pro product design for. Example again could be making a specific battery replaceable, uh, making a more efficient uh, supply unit, uh, making a specific part of the housing of the product out of recycled plastic. But how do we do this in, in, in more detailed and practical terms? What we usually do is to follow four main methods. The first one, we call it product life cycle flow. Uh, this is usually looks like a, a, a value stream map. It's a sort of a supply chain overview uh, where we also identify clear end of life scenarios, uh, stakeholders involved in these end of life scenarios and their specific needs and requirements. What we also try to do is to also integrate what we call user experience flow to really understand what is going on on the side of the user. What are really the real end of life causes uh, uh, and, and the type of obsolescence involved. So for instance, why is the user stopping to use the product? Is it because the product does not work anymore? So it's functional obsolescence or perhaps it's because the user simply wants to buy a new product, even if it, the product is, is actually still working. So it's more emotional obsolescence related issue. Uh, another method, of course, that we use is life cycle assessment uh, to identify those most relevant contributors to the product environmental impact. So which one is the product life cycle phase where the product has the highest impact, uh, even which parts, uh, specific parts have the highest, for instance, carbon footprint. Um, then we also look, for instance, into boundaries conditions uh, uh, defined by, again, uh, regulatory quality and safety constraints. Uh, this is an extremely important uh, uh, thing to do for, uh, for instance, medical uh, devices where many times we have very strict boundaries that we really have to consider and that we cannot go beyond. And finally, of course, we do business modeling to make sure that the sustainable strategy that we identify is also financially sustainable. So in the example that you see on the right, uh, an example is uh, for, for this uh, possible product, refurbishment is the strategy that is identified as the most suitable one based on all these input informations. And then based on that, we identify the design strategy necessary to enable that sustainable strategy. That again, it could be different type of design strategies. So from this point on, we are gonna go a bit more in detail in those specific steps that we will follow only if design for this assembly is identified as a, a, a suitable design strategy. We always start from what we call priority parts identification. It's very important to understand that not all the product, all the parts that, that compose the products are equally relevant for the sustainable strategy that we selected. There are some parts that have a higher importance than other. And what we really try to do when we design for this assembly is to optimize the overall design of the product and architecture of the product to make the disassembly of those specific parts as easy and fast as possible. Again, also this approach is really based on this European standard, the EN4554. 
So here we created a sort of reference overview uh, uh, for also for you to look at uh, if it can really if it can help in, in your everyday activity. We are not going to deep dive into e each part of this overview today because of time constraints, but we are going to provide all this content at the end of the presentation. Here you can see how uh, we define priority parts in different ways for different circular strategies, um, depending on the strategy that we define it, uh, the way that we identify these priority parts can vary. An example is if you look at the first line uh, for the circular strategy that is repair, the way that we identify priority parts is, is those parts with a high average occurrence of malfunctioning, complete failures or parts replacement. And on the right, you can see some data sets documentation that we usually look at as a source material to identify these parts. An example to show you how different uh, priority parts identification can be is the third line is about refurbishment. When we def define priority parts for refurbishment, we not only look at those parts that fail most often, but we also look at those parts that we are most likely to need to to replace or to disassemble to further process because of cosmetic reason, for instance, for cleaning processes, cosmetic refurbishment or hygienic reasons. So for instance, some parts that we must replace, not because they are broken, but because of regulatory, we must replace before, for instance, giving the product to a new user. So now uh, we would like to show you some, some material um, and, and tools that we use to assess usually a current design, a previous generation design or competitors, similar products that serve the same function of the product that we want to design. Um, we always do this step to really understand uh, um, what we should focus on. So it really helps to look at what was done in the past and really learn as much as possible from it and understand what should be improved in the next generation. Uh, the most intuitive things that we use is design guidelines. Uh, design guidelines are very simple to use. Uh, we use them in the earlier stages of the design process uh, um, uh, to define uh, initial, for instance, uh, redesign ambitions. Uh, they are also a very useful tool to raise awareness and really make a development team understand uh, what really means, for instance, designing for this assembly. As you could see before, um, they are 12, uh, the main design guidelines that, that we use uh, for this assembly. And uh, from each of them, uh, then we develop additional content. So for instance, uh, um, we use a lot of Miro, that is this online tool in, in, during the pandemic, uh, and uh, we develop some interactive content that can, for instance, be used during uh, uh, remote uh, online session with uh, a, 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 a broad team. Uh, and you can see that we define more specific details for each guidelines, and we also develop a sort of assessment system for it. And the idea is really to uh, assess the current design with the team and identify redesign ambitions. The second thing that we develop based on these guidelines are more complex and automatic assessment metrics um, that can be used also later in the project pro process. So you can imagine that at the beginning we define high level circular redesign ambitions and then we can use these type of metrics and tool to make sure that we are actually on the right path to achieve those initial ambitions. Another type of tool that we often use uh, uh, is the disassembly map. Uh, this is a, 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 a bit more complex tool. Uh, is a tool that we developed together with the Delft University of Technology with the Industrial Design Engineering Faculty. Uh, is a modeling method that allows you to uh, visually represent the disassembly architecture of a product uh, through this Tool from this overview, uh, you can immediately understand uh, how difficult or easy it is to disassemble a product and each part. Uh, you can see, for instance, where priority parts are located in the overall product architecture, and for instance, how many steps you have to do to reach those parts. Um, 
um, in order to share as much as possible also with the uh, external community, design community, what we have been doing is also to uh, create uh, publications about these tools, for instance, also for the disassembly map. Uh, we are going to provide some links to you also after this presentation so that if you want to dive into these tools in more detail, uh, you can find uh, all the information in, in, in these more detailed scientific articles. Um, and other tools that you see now on the screen uh, that we uh, developed that our colleague Sharina Lichtelein uh, de developed again together with the Delft University of Technology with the uh, Mechanical Engineering and Industrial, Engineer, Industrial Design Engineering Faculty is the Circular Redesign Focus Point tool. This is a, 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 a assessment metric again uh, that can be used to really point you towards specific design features and specific parts that require uh, the, the, the highest attention during the redesign process. Uh, this tool works by considering different type of parameters, for, for instance, disassembly related parameters like disassembly time, uh, number of steps uh, and, and type of tasks, but also environmental related parameters, for instance, the carbon, carbon footprint of the different parts. And as you can see from this screenshot of uh, the real tool. Uh, we made this this fake example to show you also how this really looking in in real life in the real tool. Um, you can see that the tool automatically calculates uh, what we call circular redesign necessity tool, and it really points you towards a specific part or feature that must be improved. So usually after doing all this assessment activity, we, we usually come up with a very long list of, of design features and aspects that should be tackled and improved. And many times it can really feel overwhelming, both for the design team and, and for the business. So after doing that, the first thing that we do is to do some prioritization. Uh, what we usually do is to map all those different features, those design focus areas, considering the impact that they can lead to and the effort required to implement them. So, for instance, considering cost involved and technological feasibility. Uh, what we also try to do is to create a roadmap out of it, uh, because what we want to do is not to leave anything out and in the long run to be able to cover the most important uh, focus areas. So, for instance, we define uh, short term, mid term and long term goals. Of course, after that, that, what we start to do is really to start developing the solutions. This is actually very similar to how it, it, it has always been done for a lot of other type of traditional design features. And finally, how we always try to complete the projects on circular design is to do a redesign evaluation. We really want to make sure that what we did really benefited some aspects like, for instance, environmental impact, uh, but we can also consider different type of parameters, for instance, operation time improvements, possible labor cost savings that could be determined by improved uh, disassembly, and even, for instance, improvements in the repair score for those product categories that are already covered by these new labeling systems and regulations. So uh, we also wanted to briefly show you a, a, a practical case studies that we worked on. This was really the first project that where we tested this new process and, and tools. This case study was focused on vacuum cleaners. Um, and again, the first thing that we did in this case was uh, to uh, identify those priority parts. Uh, we identify priority parts considering mainly strategies of repair and parts recovery because they were the most suitable one based on the uh, context of, of vacuum cleaners and the company. And then we also look at those parts with the highest environmental impact. The second thing that we did was to assess the design of the product. In this case, we mainly use two methods. The first one is the disassembly map that I briefly mentioned earlier, and the other one is the ease of disassembly metric. This is a tool developed by the European Commission Joint Research Center, and it allows to uh, 
quantitatively calculate the amount of disassembly and reassembly time to disassemble different parts. By using these two tools, what we saw is that most of the priority parts uh, that here you see they are indicated as target components uh, are were actually located very deep in the product architecture. You have to you had to disassemble a lot of plastic parts, plastic layers in a sequential way uh, before reaching those priority parts, uh, leading to a very unoptimized design. Our solution that we proposed to the business was to uh, redesign the product in such a way that all these plastic parts with a very low priority could be clustered in one single cluster that could be disassembled in one step instead of eight sequential and time consuming steps. And how we did it was really to try to identify the most cost effective solution. So eventually what we focused on was really the repositioning of some scruples that were positioned on these internal parts that is called the motor housing. The problem with the original design was that these uh, key uh, screws uh, were hidden beneath all this layer of plastics and that was the reason why you had to disassemble all these parts. What we did was to really uh, find a, a more optimal repositioning of, 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 of these uh, connectors in such a way that you can reach them directly from the outside of the product without having to disassemble all this layer. And what we also tried to do was to identify very good position in such a way that uh, the repositioning of these screws would not impact the aesthetic of the product. Yeah, and finally, um, as I said, we always try to do every a evaluation, redesign evaluation at the end of the project. In this case, we really decided to focus on uh, looking at the improvements at the level of operation time. And as you can see, just by using this very cost effective redesign, we managed to achieve very strong improvements at the level of operation time, like 40% faster disassembly of PCBA and motor, and even 60% faster disassembly of the core winder, which are the most important important priority parts for this product group. So apart from vacuum cleaners, we worked also on a lot of other product groups. Uh, unfortunately, we could not share a lot of content on that today because most of the material is still uh, undergoing and it, it's confidential. Um, as you can see below, uh, a lot of organizations are starting to adopt our methodologies and design tools. And this is really thanks also to the collaboration with academic excellences like TU Delft and being able uh, to share all this knowledge also outside Philips. Yeah, thank you very much, Thais. Back to you. Wow, uh, Francesco, uh, every, <laughs> every time I hear this, I, I start to ask also a lot of questions in my in my head. So um, uh, I think we're, we're definitely not done here yet, also between you and I. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, I also um, noted that I saw some people coming in later. So just to, uh, to make sure that you are aware, we are recording this webinar and the link will be shared over email after the webinar. Um, and, and yeah, before I move into the question section, um, I, I would also like to, to let you know again, uh, for those people who are late, that we are intending to share more knowledge around our circular economy practices um, across across different competences area, uh, competence areas with you, um, just to make sure that we are not just talking about design uh, for disassembly, but also about design for recycling, sustainable material selections, how we do life cycle assessments, um, sustainability and circular economy roadmaps, business modeling, value propositions, reverse logistics, and all the good stuff. So if you're interested, um, please uh, continue to follow Engineering Solutions on LinkedIn or one of us, and uh, we'll make sure that you are connected. Um, also, I want to just mention the, the amount of questions that we received before this webinar and um, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar we will also be taking those questions make sure that we cluster them as because so, some of them are the same and we will come back to you, to, to you with uh, some answers there. Um, in case that you are interested that uh, based on Francesco's story on let's say more practical engagement we're also very open to that we're very eager to start working with external parties on this topic so please to make sure to reach out to us after the uh, after the webinar. Our contact details will be shared as well. Well, then to the important part, uh, uh, the, the questions. Uh, we see quite some questions coming in, and um, 
yeah, before we start with the questions that have come in, we also wanted to answer some of your questions that we felt are relevant and, and big enough to, uh, to, to touch upon in this setting uh, before we go into the, the practical questions. So, um, Francesco, would you like to start with the first question on design that we've uh, received? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not sure I have the question with me. Uh, ah, okay. I thought you had the list. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Uh, I think it was related to uh, um, the design for recyclability and how it was uh, associated right. with the design for this assembly. Right. Maybe you can just speak to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, uh, we also uh, um, really like that question because uh, we really receive a lot of questions on, on recycling. Again, I think that, that this is also related to also different ways of, of using the the same terminology. We know that many companies and organizations actually talk about this assembly to refer to recycling. As briefly mentioned during the, um, the, the presentation, uh, recycling is a very different strategy compared to the other ones that we address today. For that reason, we don't consider design for this assembly as an enabling design strategy for recycling. For recycling, we talk about the design for dismantling and material liberation. Um, we again, uh, uh, also develop a lot of tools, methods and, and knowledge on, on recycling. So please let us know if, if that's also a topic that, that could be interesting for you, um, that for us to, to show you more on. In general, uh, the most important thing uh, to do when we design for recycling is to make sure that we are considering the right end of life stakeholders. Uh, often we just refer to recycler as if they are one single family and they all work in the same way and it could not be far from, from reality. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are different type of recyclers taking care of different type of product categories. Uh, so an example is, uh, I always give this example about ABS. ABS is a uh, plastic that uh, in principle is recyclable. However, packaging recycler don't receive a lot of ABS because not a lot of companies use ABS in packaging. For that reason, they don't recycle ABS and discard it. So if you are designing for recycling for packaging, you want to avoid to use ABS. Uh, it, it's absolutely the opposite for uh, electronic products. E-waste recycler love ABS because they receive it in very big quantities and it's also very good and, and a, a easy plastic to recycle. So if you are designing uh, electronic products, you definitely want to uh, go for ABS. Uh, even in the same product category, so for instance, electronic products, there are different types of subcategories and sub recyclers involved. For instance, the WE directive identifies uh, six main uh, categories of e waste, uh, and uh, you find different stakeholders uh, tackling each of these uh, different type of categories. Again, a very brief example is uh, fridges. Uh, when you recycle fridges, you are going to find a lot more manual disassembly, uh, manual dismantling. There are specific uh, equipment used to suck out the uh, cooling uh, um, liquid from, from the system and then usually you use, uh, for instance, uh, pneumatic pliers to remove the compressor of, of the fridge. Uh, while instead, if you look at vacuum cleaners or small household appliances, we see more and more recyclers, for instance, in Europe, using very automated uh, uh, dismantling technique. For instance, dropping the product for a very high height in such a way that it automatically breaks apart falling on the ground. Uh, going to this level of granularity and really making sure that you are in contact with the right end of life stakeholder is really important to redesign properly for recycling. Otherwise, you might end up spend, we might end up spending a lot of money on integrating design features that are actually not really helping. For instance, like using bamboo to, to improve the recyclability of electronic product. Um, on this one, and I'm going to close, I, I always uh, keep talking and talking when, when I talk about these topics. Um, we uh, develop uh, design guidelines on, on recycling, uh, and we also optimize them during a, a European funded project called uh, Policy. Um, and we actually published, we made these uh, guidelines available uh, through a collaboration with uh, uh, PESI Group, that, that is a uh, design engineering uh, firm. They made a very nice report out of it. Uh, so perhaps what we can do at the end of this webinar is also to share uh, the link to this uh, report on design for and from recycling actually uh, with you. 
Yeah, well, thanks, Francesco. Very, very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the interest and the passion uh, yeah, is always good. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, we, we are actually getting a lot of questions, right? So um, I'm trying to uh, somewhat uh, choose and pick and choose uh, in terms of uh, also addressing, let's say, more generic uh, audiences. I think one question that is standing out from uh, Elsa de Ridder, also an early question, and so rewarding the earlier question uh, uh, um, closures. But is, is what is, in your opinion, is the role of medtech startups in circularity? Um, is, and, and I think especially, so I think medtech is, is, is one piece of the question, but the other part is really, is, is, is circular design something uh, you need to implement from the start? Uh, or do you need to establish yourself as a circular organization later? Um, I, I will start by giving a very high level uh, um, answer to that and then Francesco can also become a little bit more granular. So what, what we experience in Philips is that when we talk about circular design, the earlier you start, even in your value proposition creation, right, the easier it becomes to continue to hold on to the principles that you embedded early in that uh, value proposition, right? So if you are a startup, if you are in part of a startup, the advice is embed circular economy related principles, whether they are related to the design or the business model or the logistics of your product, uh, embed them as early as possible because reverse engineering them into products is much, much harder than uh, doing it right from the start. I don't know if you want to add anything from. Yeah, I, I could not agree more, Thais. I, I really think that it's important to really address this topic as soon as possible in the process. This is also the feedback that we are receiving by any client business that we have been working on. And uh, again, it's very important to define the right priorities at the start. We have to make sure that we don't uh, spend resources on, on the right, wrong type of priorities. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Francesco. Yeah, again, uh, I will have another look at all the questions in a second. Um, uh, but maybe first, um, uh, a question about, let's say, a historic a history. So um, the question is from Edward Tonino. It's a it's a question that is atypical, I guess. Um, so although we are moving entirely into healthcare, um, what will be happening to domestic appliances and audio products to be created? and how will uh, we take care of design for this assembly and repair? Well, a very high level answer to that is that um, with these um, Philips family members, I would call them, we have uh, clear agreements on how they would also uh, need to apply our sustainability and circular economy principles in their product design, right? So what you will see moving forward is also, you know, aligned with the Philips brand um, continue to see improvements in the sustainability of our product ranges in line with the agreement that we have with uh, domestic appliances uh, and with uh, other Philips uh, branded products. So yeah, the brand value will continue to stay strong in that direction and we are committed to, uh, to, uh, to, to continue to drive that not just within our existing organization but also within our broader family. Um, then of course has uh, circular design is something it is designing out the concept of waste of new products. And of course, there are a lot of initiatives, a lot of programs that deal with how we deal, that deal with the, the question, how do you deal with products that have already entered the market? And that's not just something that Philips is involved in, but that's also where we find a lot of strength and inspiration with the partnerships that we have with, um, with for instance, the Pace Network or within the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. That's the short answer for now. Um, and I will move on to another question. Um, and that's, I think, one for Francesco so that I can have another look at the other questions. Um, the question from Martin van Olfen is, uh, do you also use the hotspot mapping and circularity calculator from TU Delft? Yeah, so um, yeah, they are, they are both great tools. Uh, uh, we we have been using some of them in, in the past. Uh, in particular, the hotspot mapping tool is also at the base of uh, the tool that we showed you today, the, the uh, circular economy, for, uh, the circular design focus point tool. Uh, so definitely, and uh, with TUDELF, we have a very close uh, relation, I would say. We are practically in contact, uh, uh, yeah, very often, and uh, we are definitely going to keep using uh, tools and methods that uh, we develop together and also tools uh, that, that are developed also independently by TUDELF. Yeah, 
Um, I'm just looking at another question um, that I just saw coming in from Robbie. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Francesco, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, books around uh, circular innovation uh, or, or maybe publications um, that, that you would like to recommend to the audience. Can you refer uh, um, yeah. Robbie to any of them? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, as said, we are already going to share some of them at the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, we publish uh, two publications on the disassembly map tool, so very applied uh, um, 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 tools specific for specific design strategies. Again, the work that was done by the policy consortium is definitely something that I, I would suggest everybody to look at if you are interested in learning more about the recycling industry and how to design for recycling. Uh, overall, I, I always really like, uh, um, uh, I think they are called MOOC, uh, they, they are online open, open, open uh, uh, courses. Uh, yeah, and again, I don't want always to go back and, and, and uh, connect to, 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 to Delft, but the truth is that I think that what the, some of the most, the best courses that I, I've seen on this topic so far are really coming from them. There is uh, courses on uh, design engineering, for circular economy recently they are gonna uh, soon they are gonna do a course on design for recycling uh, and there is much more so for instance also courses to learn about uh, circular economy calculator that someone else was referring to earlier um, and then of course uh, there are those sources like the lm carter foundations ideal uh, there are so many different uh, uh, organizations that are really starting to develop a lot of material on this overall topic i suppose that you Really depends also what level uh, uh, you you really want to 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 get information on. So again, for really practical um, uh, inputs, I would really go for uh, um, the publication that we are going to share after these uh, workshops, and definitely the the MOOC provided by by TU Delft. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I don't know if you ties maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I think there's a, there, there's a lot of inspirational things. Yeah. I think also the yeah. From a more philosophical perspective, there is a lot of systems thinking um, materials that uh, you know I think creates the right mindset to be able to think in circularity. And circularity is not just about design or business models, but it's also about collaboration, interdependency, yeah. complexity theory. So if you uh, type in system thinking into uh, your, uh, your or, or you look into into systems thinking in your local bookshop. Uh, then uh, please uh, uh, guide yourself and try to uh, um, yeah, find something in that direction. I think Donella Meadows there is a, a well-known author that uh, that uh, basically laid the foundation of that, uh, let's say, um, school of thought. So uh, yeah, go ahead and, and look out and otherwise reach out and I'll get you some titles. Um, let me see, yeah, lots, uh, still lots of questions coming in. Um, uh, they are not all coming through yet. But I think that uh, I would like to rephrase a question from Navita. So the question is, have you been uh, able, I guess, to develop a framework for which standards that can be used for dismantling modularity and parts we use for a broader range of products uh, than your own? Uh, I think if I rephrase the question, if I understand it correctly, is this a framework uh, that you're showing only relevance for Philips is, or, or can we apply it to, to all products? Or, or maybe is there a specific scope that we're looking yeah. at? Yeah, so I think that the, the 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 interesting thing is that Philips has a very broad uh, portfolio. So whatever we develop between Philips, uh, usually it's actually applicable to a lot of different product categories. So uh, we we have been doing projects on small personal care products and big equipment. In general, what we have been focusing a lot on is those product categories that, of course, um, are, 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 are more focused on Philips. So uh, small and big uh, uh, electronic products. Uh, we have been also working a lot on, uh, on uh, uh, design for recycling for these categories and we also have been doing something on 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 packaging overall i would say that most of the tools and methods that we showed uh, are really thought through to to be applicable to a wide range of products not so not simply on on vacuum cleaners but also on a lot of other things and for instance also the design guidelines for recycling that i was mentioning earlier uh, are design guidelines that are quite 
general to be applied on different categories of, of electronic products. What we usually do is always to use these methods as a starting point, and then uh, in each project, uh, we really try to define specific knowledge and, and, for instance, requirements and guidelines for the specific product and context that we are looking at. So again, also, for instance, the guidelines for this assembly, those are simply a starting point. Then, of course, they have to be adapted to the specific context of the specific product that we are looking at. But yeah, so again, as a recap, I always tend to, to give very long answers. Um, all the content that you saw is, is in my opinion, applicable to uh, much beyond what Philips produces. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Francesco. Again, uh, continue to see uh, questions popping up. Um, uh, just going to uh, go into this question from Katie with about four minutes left for the Q&A. And so please note that we will be taking all questions and we will come back to you, um, but we're picking a couple of them. Um, so the question from Katie is, do you ever calculate that refurbishment or upgrading is the most sustainable design strategy for consumer products, or is it always repair for this area? Yeah, so uh, we always try not to start uh, with with already some 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 decisions in mind. Uh, I think that the best approach that you can use is really to start uh, by considering the big pictures and really to go through that process that that I showed uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Each product uh, sometimes has different type of context, and for that reason different strategies might be the most suitable and most important one for sustainability. Um, so uh, um, definitely we are looking into a, a lot into repair for, uh, for consumer products, uh, since we also see a clear direction coming, for instance, by, from the European Commission. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would never give for granted uh, uh, that any specific uh, strategy is the most suitable one. I would always go back to data collection, right? Really understand again your end of life stakeholder, really understand what determines the end of life of the product to identify the most suitable design strategy. Again, many times we might give for granted very important information. So for instance, we could start uh, designing a product for this assembly and repair, and then we find out later that actually that product is extremely durable. It doesn't fail uh, from about the use life, uh, what really determines the end of life of the product is simply the uh, consumer deciding to throw it away just to buy a, a, a new version that perhaps it, it, it's, it's more uh, up to with, with the trends. So again, uh, like my answer is really never give anything for granted, never start from, from the point of view that there are specific uh, strategies that are always the best one for specific product categories, always start from um, uh, your data collection action and, and really make your information speak and and uh, define what is the most suitable strategy. Thanks, Francesco. Yeah, so, so I think for, towards the last question, um, what I do see is that um, that um, overall, eh, so just to uh, acknowledge the questions that are coming in, we have some questions coming in on the business role. Eh? Is, this, is this really sustainable from a business perspective? Uh, I think that's a question that also uh, needs a little bit deeper engagement. So we will be taking those questions offline and we will also supplying the, the, the answers to those questions with the broader audience. Uh, the other question type of questions that we see is, um, is, um, is around collaboration, right? So it's not just about technical um, feasibility no, more often, but it's really about how do we collaborate yeah. uh, with our teams? What is our role in those teams? And uh, for instance, uh, how do we collaborate with engineers? Uh, but I think that's a broader question and that we also address uh, Philips wide across different sustainability topics in which we have uh, uh, group sustainability uh, colleagues that play an important role, but we also play a role. And maybe you can, uh, Francesco, just elaborate a little bit on what our role is and how you see that collaboration coming to life in our organization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that perhaps this is one of the most interesting um, 
um, a part of, of circular economy is really something that there cannot be uh, just in integrated and achieved uh, uh, by one single uh, stakeholder is really something that different type of stakeholders have to collaborate on. So of course in the in between a company different type of departments have to collaborate on it. Uh, there are some challenges that are more technical related for instance and then there are some challenges that are more for instance uh, user behavior related. Uh, uh, overall we always say that the circular economy is really a, 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 is, is a, a, a system related um, issue, is a system related topic. Uh, we really have to consider the big picture and, and address it in a systematic way if we really want to make a, 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 a big change. Uh, what we see between Philips is, is that collaboration between, between uh, uh, the, our engineering department, uh, the design department, the business department uh, is really fundamental to make sure Sure that we can eventually um, deliver a good uh, circular proposition that take into account all these uh, um, more systemic uh, kind of uh, issue. Um, what we specifically uh, do um, is, is, is really to play this uh, supporting role, uh, again also together with colleagues, for instance, from the design department, to really guide uh, the overall strategies of businesses and R&D and really make sure, again, that the right priorities are set at the beginning, at the earlier stages of, of the design process to be properly integrated in the and product. So I, at the design level, of course, but also at the business level as well. So yeah, it must be sustainable, uh, financially sustainable as well at the end. Yeah, well, well th thanks a lot for that, uh, that answer, uh, Francesco. What, what I believe we see, uh, if, first of all, thanks a lot again for all the questions. Uh, really interesting, shows a lot of engagement. We are also very happily um, not surprised, but happily confirmed, I would almost say, with the amount of attendees today and the, uh, all the overall interest. So uh, again, uh, reconfirming that we will have a look at your questions, try to answer them in a, in a, in a consistent manner over, over, over email afterwards. Uh, please also continue to, uh, to feel free to, uh, to uh, follow up with us. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to getting in touch with you or staying in touch with you and uh, until the next one. Thanks a lot. Thank you.